Welcome back to Tech Ambrosia. This is the first episode in a new series I'm starting called the Retro Build Guide. With this series, I'm shining the spotlight on a variety of retro PC builds that you can do today, one platform per episode. I'll discuss the pros and cons of the platform, the market for parts, show off a demonstration build here in my studio, and tell you about my experience, including any gotchas I encountered while building and using the PC. In this episode of Retro Build Guides, I'm taking a look at building using the Cyrix Media GX Multimedia PC platform from 1998. All set? Bottoms up. Let's start with a quick overview of the platform. As it stands today, the buildable MediaGX platform consists of motherboards based around the Cyrix CX5530 companion chipset, like this ECS P5GXM example here. While you may immediately notice the well-known PGA321 socket for the CPU, most commonly referred to as Socket 7, the board itself is only compatible with three chips. The original Cyrix Media GXM, released by Cyrix before they merged with National Semiconductor, the NAT Semi Geode GXM, which is essentially the same chip with a different silk, silk screen on top, uh, and finally, the die shrunk Geode GX1, which includes some very minor updates to its silicon, runs significantly cooler than the GXM, and is available in a faster 300 MHz clock speed. The Media GX chip itself is more than just a CPU and includes an SD RAM memory controller, VGA controller, PCI host bus controller, and Sound Blaster 16 compatible audio circuitry. These chips use Cyrix's venerable 5x86 CPU core for general purpose compute and include that CPU's 16 kilobyte level 1 cache and 256 entry line cache. Because of the integrated memory controller and limited die space, there's no level 2 cache available on the platform. That memory controller itself is driven off a clock divider from the main CPU and capable of up to 100 MHz operation. The motherboard includes a large number of integrated features including onboard PS2, parallel and serial ports, audio and joystick ports, as well as early USB ports. While it's not able to boot from the USB ports, although I didn't try a USB floppy drive, its built-in IDE controller supports ATAP CD-ROMs and LBA mode hard drive addressing making initial setup easier than earlier platforms of similar performance levels. About that performance level, despite the relatively high clock speeds, the 5x86 CPU core makes this chip more akin to a fast 486 in terms of performance per clock than anything approaching a classic Pentium, let alone a Pentium 2. A good rule of thumb is that a Media GX or Geo GX1 is slightly faster than a Pentium running at half the clock speed. This makes the platform performance competitive with Socket 5 Pentiums between 75 and 150 MHz. The built-in audio subsystem uses the CPU to emulate OPL3, and while it's not the highest quality OPL emulation I've heard, it is extremely compatible and requires no drivers or utilities to function. Windows 95 and 98 drivers exist for both the built-in VGA and sound, enabling GUI acceleration and high color modes, and of course audio within Windows. That's the platform overview, so what are the pros of building a retro PC using a Media GX? Honestly, the biggest pro is the design simplicity and convenience of the platform itself. Cyrix intended the Media GX to enable low cost, turnkey multimedia PCs, and this second revision, the Media GX M, delivers most fully on that promise. Visa compatible VGA and Sound Blaster 16 compatible sound, coupled with support for large amounts of fast RAM and, of course, CD-ROM support out of the box, make this about as simple a multimedia PC build as they come. The second biggest pro to this platform is the relative modernity of the components. The motherboards are ATX form factor, specifically micro ATX in this board's case, and so fit comfortably in modern cases. The boards use a standard 20-pin ATX power connector and have no unusual voltage loading characteristics. No unusually high loading on the 5-volt rail for this system, and that means any modern power supply can run these boards. No need to track down vintage power supplies or anything. 
In comparison with Socket 5, the Media GX uses SDRAM DIMMs instead of FastPage or ETO SIMs. SDRAM, of course, became ubiquitous in the years since the Media GX was introduced, making acquiring RAM today for this system a relatively trivial experience on the secondary market. The built-in parallel ATA controller again supports LBA mode addressing, enabling large hard drive support out of the box, without the need for a drive overlay or drive extender, making SD card to IDE adapters the ideal choice for booting the system. There are, however, definitely some downsides to this platform. The first and most important downside is the lack of meaningful CPU options. The Media GX and its rebadged successors are basically the same CPU, with only clock speed and heat output differentiating them. This leads into the second big downside of the platform, performance. The Media GX runs out of steam pretty quickly. DOS gaming on this platform is superb, but Windows 95 and 98 gaming is a much more mixed bag experience. Some early games like StarCraft, Dune 2000, and Pod run fine, while later games like Heroes 3, Hexen 2, and anything newer than that are too lethargic to be enjoyable. Also technically a downside is there's no AGP support for the platform, although in practical terms that doesn't really matter because none of these CPUs are fast enough to warrant AGP accelerators. Alright, with theoreticals out of the way, I'd like to focus on the practical aspect of this build. What you can buy and build today and for what money. To that end, I built one of these machines a few months ago and have been using it as a retro gaming PC since then. Let's dive into what I found, what I love, and what gotchas cropped up along the way. I've centered this build around the ECS P5GXM Micro ATX motherboard. Other boards do exist for this platform, but the only board I've seen out in the wild with any regularity is this ECS version. Phil's Computer Lab took a look at this platform a few years ago, and just recently CPU Galaxy also took a dive into the Media GX, and both of these folks were using this board. The board itself includes two PCI slots, two non-shared ISA slots, and two SD-RAM slots, along with typical late 90s integrated I.O. Two IDE channels for hard drives and optical drives, a floppy connector, parallel and serial on the backplate, as well as integrated sound joystick and VGA. For input devices, we have two PS2 ports, one for keyboard and one for mouse, and two USB 1.0 ports. If I compare it to a similar board for Socket 7, you can see that it doesn't use the PC99 color scheme for the rear I.O. ports, so that's something to note. I also want to note that if you're a serial mouse aficionado, these serial ports are too modern for Microsoft serial mice. They don't provide enough voltage to initialize the mouse in serial mode, so that's kind of a bummer. As I mentioned before, the motherboard is compatible with three CPUs. The original Media GXM released before Cyrix's merger with National Semiconductor, available from 180 to 266 MHz and running at 2.9 volts. Then the Geode GXM, which is a rebadge of the Media GXM and is available in the same clock speeds and voltages. Finally, the Geode GX1, which is a die shrunk GXM that's available in 300 and sometimes 333 MHz variants. The GX1 runs at 2 volts, but this board only goes down to 2.1, which actually ends up working just fine with the GX1. To get started, the CPU and motherboard are all you need. The board provides basic I.O. through the companion chip, along with the NAT Semi Super I.O. chip, and of course, VGA and audio are handled by the CPU itself. The board does, however, provide those tantalizing expansion slots, and for the most part, they've been very compatible. My Sound Blaster 16 works great, but my ESS 1869 won't initialize, for example. However, every PCI VGA card I've tried has worked just fine, including higher power draw cards like my Voodoo 3 2000 PCI. If you add a PCI VGA card, you can choose to use the built-in VGA as a second monitor or disable it entirely in the BIOS. And yes, it's perfectly possible to pair a Voodoo graphics card or a Voodoo 2 with the internal VGA to save a slot. The combo that, in my opinion, makes probably the most sense is a PCI VGA card of some kind to speed up Doom Engine games and provide more video memory for Windows, 
and an ISA sound card with Wave Blaster support, along with a Wave Blaster of your choice, vintage or modern. Short of tracking down an MT32 for the smattering of older games that supported that music system instead of general MIDI, those three things turned this machine into just about the ultimate DOS gaming PC, and I think that's where this platform really shines. That brings me to my conclusion and recommendations for this platform. So, the too long didn't watch for the Media GX? I think it's the ultimate DOS gaming PC. Now that is an incredibly divisive declaration, so please let me defend and clarify it. First, calling anything the ultimate DOS gaming PC is more than a little hyperbolic. Your ultimate DOS gaming PC might be a hopped up 286 that plays games from the 80s. That's totally valid. Or maybe you're not satisfied with anything slower than a Pentium 3 because you want to play all of your old school first person shooters at high resolutions. That too is completely valid. The reason I suggest this platform for DOS gaming is twofold. First of all, in all my years of building PCs, I've never found a platform as easy and turnkey to get working in DOS as this one. It's kind of incredible. Secondly, it's not so plug and play that if this is your first DOS PC build, it's not going to teach you anything about how computers were assembled back in the bad old days. So my bottom line is, the reason I think it's a perfect DOS gaming platform is if you're looking to play games released during the golden age of DOS gaming from like late 91 through to the release of Quake in 96 and Shadow Warrior in 97, this one platform, this one platform will play all of those games. It slots perfectly into about 1996's average PC performance levels, and you can slow it down, often with clock speed alone, to play more speed-sensitive titles from earlier in the decade, like Day of the Tentacle or Descent 1. If you're interested in building your first retro DOS gaming PC and playing DOS games on real hardware, I highly recommend giving the Media GX a serious look. Also, if you're curious about what building older PCs was like, but the complexity found in platforms like Socket 3 or early Socket 5 or Socket 7 is a bit too intimidating, I think this platform might make a really good introduction to the vintage PC build process and what PC hardware was like before it all left DOS behind. Retro PC gaming is an interesting phenomenon. Unlike retro console gaming, there aren't any clearly defined generations or eras or platforms. A PC hardware in the wild has always been incredibly diverse and of wildly varying performance levels. <laughs> that was as true in the 90s as it is today. The market forces of the 90s don't apply today, of course, and we're free to experience DOS gaming through whatever lens we like. DOS is a completed problem, after all. There's nothing new being made for it, with some notable exceptions. So you're free to choose the lens through which you experience this little bit of computing history. I think the Media GXM provides a pretty accurate distillation of what PC gaming was like in the early and mid 90s, the, the highs and the lows. I really enjoyed building and using the system that I put together here, and it brought back a lot of nostalgia for me. If you're at all curious about putting together a DOS gaming machine using real hardware, I think this is a really great platform to use. And with that, our glasses are empty and our brains are full. I hope you enjoyed this special Tech Ambrosia presentation, the retro build guide for the Cyrix Media GX. If you enjoyed this look into computing platforms of the past, please consider subscribing. I'm planning to do more of these in the future. For example, I have a slot one build underway as I record this episode and I'm gathering parts for AMD's famous Socket A Athlons, as well as components for the iconic and much sought after today, Socket 7 and Super Socket 7 platforms. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Mm. Gosh, it is just nuclear. It's just nuclear. Fold. First, of all, for, 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 I don't know where I can stop that one. Oh, that tastes so bad. <laughs> Started, the CPU and motherboard are all you need. The IO, the IO provides a board, the board provides IO. <laughs>